Welcome to the third and final video for Chapter 5. This one's going to be a little bit longer because it didn't really make sense to divide this topic up, but we're going to be talking more about specific hormones and their effects on the body. So, last lecture we discussed um, the different classes of hormones. So again, today we're discussing more specific hormones and also a couple important endocrine structures. So the most important endocrine structure, well, it's, you, you could argue it with the hypothalamus, but one of the most certainly is the pituitary gland. So this gland is actually very, very small. Um, it weighs only about a gram and occupies about a square centimeter of space um, right under the hypothalamus. But it's extremely important for the endocrine system. The pituitary gland actually consists of two main parts that develop from different embryonic tissues and thus have completely different functions. You have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary, which we'll discuss in the coming slides. So first is, um, we'll talk about the pituitary stalk. Um, so this is actually a, um, it contains blood vessels and many axons, and they only extend to the posterior pituitary. They do not connect with the anterior pituitary. And they, as you see here, connect with the hypothalamus. So this is one way that the hypothalamus connects and influences the pituitary gland. First, we will discuss the posterior pituitary, which releases two important hormones that you need to know about, oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin is involved in many aspects of parental and reproductive behavior, and it's often used in medical settings in order to induce labor. Um, in mothers who have recently given birth, it also triggers the milk letdown reflex, which is an important reflex for breastfeeding. Uh, vasopressin is, um, actually increases blood pressure by causing the blood vessels to contract, which also inhibits the formation of urine. So this is important um, in maintaining homeostasis for times when, for instance, water is scarce. Um, so if someone's thirsty, vasopressin will be released in order to help conserve water and maintain homeostasis for as long as possible. Oxytocin and vasopressin both have been implicated in social behavior. Uh, for instance, in male mice with oxytocin knocked out, so again, this means that they don't have the receptors for oxytocin, so they're completely um, immune to it, I guess you'd say. They, they um, aren't affected by it. They display a social amnesia, which is where they're unable to recognize females and that they've previously encountered. So we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So to understand the anterior pituitary, the other side, we must first start with the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is influenced by circulating messages, such as other hormones, um, and there, it's also influenced by synaptic inputs from other brain areas. Then, as we discussed a bit last time, the hypothalamus produces a releasing hormone, which affects the anterior pituitary and causes it to release those tropic hormones. Um, so releasing hormones are carried to the anterior pituitary, which then releases the tropic hormone. The axons from the hypothalamic neurons that synthesize um, releasing hormones have their axons converge on the median eminence, which is the midline feature at the base of the brain, um, which is where the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary gland. So the anterior pituitary releases six tropic hormones. Although we will discuss um, briefly what each one does, the important part for you is just to be able to identify which hormones are in the sets and which are not in the sets, and know that the sets are released from the anterior pituitary gland. If you know the basics about each, and you know that um, they are tropic hormones from the anterior pituitary gland, you will be fine. 
So ACTH, ACTH um, controls the production and release of adrenal of the adrenal cortex, which is responsible for the release of steroid hormones. TSH increases the release of thyroid hormones um, from, you guessed it, the thyroid gland, and it also affects the size of the thyroid gland. There are two gonadotrophins, uh, which are, um, as the name suggests, of hormones that affect the gonads. So there's the follicle stimulating hormone, which sadly does not encourage hair growth, or I would be all about it. No, it's actually, um, it's the name for, um, its name is because one of its actions is in the ovary, where it stimulates the growth and maturation of the egg containing follicles. And it also um, influences the secretion of estrogen. In men, it governs um, sperm production. So again, it's going to be affecting the gonads. This makes sense. They're also luteinizing hormones. These stimulate the follicles in the ovary to rupture, which causes the release of the egg. Um, and then the collapsed ovarian follicles then form into a corpora lutea, which is a major source of progesterone. And in men, luteinizing hormone um, causes the testes to produce testosterone. So as you can see in both women and men, very related to um, reproductive um, behaviors. The last two tropic hormones affect the body's growth and milk production. Prolactin is called that because it promotes lactation in female mammals. It's also closely related with parental behavior in many species. Lastly, growth hormone acts throughout the body to influence the growth of cells. It is released almost exclusively during sleep. Um, starvation, vigorous exercise, and stress all actually can inhibit growth hormone, causing um, psychosocial dwarfism in extreme cases. So actually, if it's bad enough, if you have enough stress and enough major life problems, it can make you shorter because you're not getting enough growth hormone released. So there's more in the book on this if you're curious about it. I think it's about 5.2, but don't quote me on that. So the adrenal glands um, are located at the top of each kidney and they secrete adrenal hormones. So the adrenal medulla is especially important um, because it secretes the amine hormone epinephrine, better known as adrenaline, and also norepinephrine, which prepares the body for action. Um, because this has to be done very quickly, again, fight or flight, this has to be done very quickly, this action is actually under the direct control of the brain, which differentiates it some from the rest of the um, endocrine system. So as you see here, um, in mammals, with the adrenal gland, um, the outer 80% of the gland is actually called the adrenal cortex, and the core 20% is the adrenal medulla. So with the adrenal medulla, even though it's a very small part of it, as you can see, it actually has a pretty big impact in that it's um, important for secreting both epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the adrenal cortex excretes a variety of hormones um, known as adrenocorticoids, and also, or also known as adrenal steroids, due to um, where they're from. So one group of these are called glutical corticoids. They help car carbohydrate regulation and also affect inflammation. The stress hormone cortisol is also a glutocorticoid. It increases the amount of glucose that's found in the bloodstream um, through breaking down proteins. In high concentrations, glucocorticoids reduce swelling, which is why synthetic glucocorticoids, such as steroid, um, the steroid prednisone, uh, which probably many of you have been prescribed, I've been prescribed for bronchitis, are very important drugs because they can help in reducing that um, inflammation. So, a second group of um, adrenal steroids 
um, are the mineral corticoids. So they're nameless because they affect minerals such as sodium and potassium in the body. The primary mineral corticoid is um, aldosterone. Um, so I'll, I mispronounced that. I think it's aldosterone, though, again, don't quote me. So aldosterone um, causes the kidneys to retain sodium, um, which reduces urine production. So with this, it's another way that the body can maintain homeostasis, either by increasing or decreasing urine production. Uh, the adrenal cortex also produces sex hormones, such as the adrostenosone, um, such as adrostenosone, um, which contributes to an adult pattern of body hair for men and as well as for women. Also, high levels of an androstenosone in women can lead to a more masculine appearance. Located just below the larynx, uh, near the location of the Adam's apple, lies the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland produces several hormones. Don't worry about the names. We'll refer to them as the thyroid hormones. So thyroid hormones have widespread effects throughout the body, including growth, metabolism, and maintenance of the brain. Thyroid's uh, stimulating hormone is released by the anterior pituitary gland in order to, you guessed it, stimulate the thyroid and lead to the secretion of thyroid hormones. So that's how this one is managed. So the anterior pituitary um, sends out that thyroid stimulating hormone, causing the thyroid to release hormones. Um, Thyroid stimulating hormones are amine hormones, but they are an exception to the rule because they act much like the steroid hormone in that they regulate gene expression. The thyroid hormones um, all contain iodine, and they're all very reliant upon the supply of iodine. Having a diet that's lacking in iodine can lead to several health problems, including a goiter, which is what you see here. It's a swelling of the thyroid gland due to an iodine deficiency. Um, iodine deficiency is actually estimated to affect about 2 billion people worldwide. Huge problem. And it's one of the leading causes of intellectual disability um, when it occurs during development. One way that this has actually been addressed, as you may have noticed that on table salt, it's often called iodized salt. Iodine is actually added to salt in order to help ensure that people don't have iodine deficiencies, because there are a lot of places in the world where iodine doesn't occur naturally in the food otherwise, so there aren't that many opportunities to get iodine into one's diet. Almost all aspects of reproductive behavior, including mating and parental behavior, depend on hormones. Uh, this will be covered far greater in Chapter 12, but we'll touch on the physiology here. So the gonads are responsible for creating set steroids. Um, so what happens is the hypothalamus starts us off by releasing GnRH, which is the gonad releasing hormone which then stimulates the anterior pituitary to release either the follicle stimulating hormone that we talked about or releasing the luteinizing hormone, both of which we discussed earlier. So that influences um, our actual, um, the actual gonads. So the testes here are responsible for producing sperm, as we know, as well as producing hormones called androgens which includes such um, steroids such as testosterone. So testosterone is regulated by the luteinizing hormone, which is regulated by GnRH, which again is that gonad releasing hormone. So this probably doesn't make sense, so let's talk about this a little bit more on the next slide here. So what you see here, so the hypothalamus affects the anterior pituitary, which leads to a release either of the follicle stimulating hormone or the luteinizing hormone, both of which have different effects on the testes. So with it, it can either uh, produce sperm or produce testosterone, depending on which one it is. And then this leads to a feedback loop where um, as testosterone or other androgens get into the bloodstream, 
it leads to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary shutting this down so you don't have too much production going on. So this is how the brain controls the production of both sperm and, as well as these um, important androgens. So the female gonads, as you know, are called ovaries, and they produce the female set some um, steroid hormones. There are two major classes of these hormones, uh, progestins, uh, such as progesterone, and estrogens, such as estradiol. Um, estrogen plays an important role in the development of the secondary sex characteristics and regulating the menstrual cycle in women. And in men, it's associated with sturm um, maturation. Progesterone also has a number of physiological effects that are enhanced by the presence of es um, estrogen as estrogen leads to an upregulation of progesterone receptors. So the presence of estrogen actually makes you more sensitive to progesterone. So progesterone is sometimes called the hormone of pregnancy as it's important for several roles in the development of the fetus. Similar to men, uh, ovar ovarian hormones are controlled by the luteinizing hormone and the follicle-stimulating hormones. Both are controlled by GnRH. So also, both women and men have um, the other sex hormone. So women will have testosterone, men will have estrogen. However, what happens is the testes turn a smaller proportion of testosterone into estradiol, again an estrogen, uh, whereas the ovaries will convert most of the testosterone into estradiol. Um, so that's the differences in the proportion of the sex hormones. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is estrogen and or progestin are both involved in oral contraception as well. So in case you're curious about how those work, oral contraceptives contain small doses of either synthetic estrogen or progestin. These um, exert a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus, inhibiting the release of the GnRH, which then prevents the release of the um, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, therefore preventing the ovaries from releasing AIDS. So let's look at this. So again, what you have is hypothalamus releases this um, GnRH, which leads to the um, anterior pituitary, releasing either the follicle-stimulating hormone or the luteinizing hormone, which leads to the AIDS development and the AIDS release. And with this, it results also in estrogens and progesterone, and both of these are in influencing the negative feedback loop. So as estrogens or progesterone increase, this process decreases. So what um, oral contraceptives do is they artificially increase these levels to make it so this system never revs up so you don't have the AIDS being released. So that, that's how those work in case you're curious about that. I just thought that was interesting. Uh, the pineal gland is another very small gland that has a huge impact on the body. It sits at the top of the brain stem and is actually covered by the cerebral cortex, um, as you can see in the picture on the right. As we mentioned before, although most, most structures are found on both sides of the brain, the pineal gland is whole and not lateralized. It plays a significant role in biological rhythms, including the circadian rhythm. The pineal gland is responsible for releasing the amine hormone melatonin, which provides the body with a signal of day versus night. Many people take melatonin thinking that it's a sedative. It's not. It actually just signals to the body that it's night. Um, it can actually also be very helpful for treating jet lag. More on this when we get to the sleep chapter, but it's a very important hormone in the body. Um, as you've likely been told forever and have um, strongly experienced in your teen years, hormones can play a strong role in sexual behavior. As we previously discussed, oxytocin um, is important for nursing babies and for their mothers, but it's also related to social and sexual behavior. For instance, 
oxytocin is released in both men and women upon orgasm, which adds to the pleasurable feelings. In rodents, actually giving extra oxytocin leads to more time spent in physical contact with each other, whereas a lack of oxytocin also appears to be important. As I mentioned earlier, if you have oxytocin knocked out, there's a social amnesia for mice where they seem to be unable to recognize the scent of the female mice that they met before. However, this goes away when they're injected with oxytocin. Oxytocin also seems to help protect um, fetal neurons during childbirth, so it has many, many roles. So, okay, now I have a brief video for you, just a little bit on oxytocin. A recent study found men with low social competence demonstrated more empathy after a few squirts of oxytocin in a nasal spray. Dr. Holly Phillips of WCBS-TV is here with more on what's called the cuddle chemical. Great to see you, Dr. <laughs> Phillips. Morning, Rebecca. And this cuddle chemical, it's oxytocin. How does it work? What does it do? Where do we find it? Sure. Well, oxytocin is actually a naturally occurring hormone. It's secreted by the pituitary gland in our brains. Now, uh, women secrete more of the hormone than men, and it's usually secreted most around childbirth. And it's thought to really help with bonding, uh, empathy with others, communication. Um, and part of the reason it's secreted so much during childbirth is it helps the mother bond with the child and form those attachments after birth, but it might also have some other uses. <laughs> other uses, for example, like making men nicer that this study showed. Where would you find, if you wanted to go out and purchase it right now, is there a place where you could buy it? No, it is, it is prescription only, and it's really only used in labor and delivery. So doctors have to prescribe it to women, and it induces labor. Um, it's not yet used in this context. But really, this was an interesting study. Researchers looked at 27 men uh, and gave them what was called an empathetic accuracy test. It's basically a score of, our, of the social competence. Now, men who had the lowest score going in who took the oxytocin nasal spray were thought to be more sensitive, more understanding, and more empathetic afterwards. So we saw the actual study did show that these men were uh, nicer afterwards. Yeah. In terms of the practical applications for this study, what are scientists getting at here? Right. Well, the researchers were interested in doing this study primarily uh, because they think it might be of benefit for people who have social anxiety disorders or in some syndromes like autism and the autism spectrum disorders. It might help with people. Uh, it might help people build those attachments and bonding um, that can be problems in those disorders. But it's still a ways away. It's not something that's going to be used right now. We have to look at the side effect profile and see how much benefit um, it might be. Uh, and and it, the application for those insensitive boyfriends is still <laughs> way down the line. Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you so much. We appreciate you being with us here. Sure. Such Anytime. an interesting topic. So there you go. Another possible use of oxytocin is, you know, making your boyfriend or husband a little bit more understanding and socially aware. Um, so oxytocin uh, very strongly related with social, not even social graces, but just social skills as well. So a very multifaceted hormone. And one of the reasons I said on the first day of class, I believe it'd be difficult to be competent um, clinical psychologists without a background in biological psychology is because there are many types of hormone dysfunction that look a lot like psychiatric illness. For instance, um, parathyroid deficiency can look a lot like schizophrenia and hypothyroidism, which is described at the very beginning of chapter five, or low testosterone actually, um, can look a lot like clinical depression. I actually had a client that had low testosterone that looked a lot like clinical depression. Um, on the other side, if the thyroid is overactive, patients can appear to be extremely anxious. There's also, um, there appears to be a genetic, genetically inherited form of ADHD that appears to be related to a decreased sensitivity of thyroid hormone. And long-term excess um, in glucocorticoids can lead to Cushing's disease, which has symptoms of fatigue, depression, and abnormal hair growth. So again, it's important to be aware of the fact that 
many of these physical disorders can look a lot like psychiatric disorders. So when you're treating psychiatric disorders, you want to double check and make sure that it's not actually explained by a physical disorder, or else you may be treating something and not benefiting your client.